Welcome to virtual worship at Montgomery Presbyterian Church on August 16, 2020. The Elder of the Month is Beth Dobreiner and the Deacon of the Month is Lois Silver. Please join me in the call to worship. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard on the beard of Aaron running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained the blessing, life forevermore. have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us but if we confess our sins God who is merciful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness in humility and faith let us confess our sin as we pray together merciful God we confess that just like Jesus' disciples we too sometimes lose patience with people who need our help and support. Like the disciples, we find ourselves wishing that they would just go away and leave us in haste. In your mercy, forgive us. Remind us again of the deep love you showed for us when we were still in need, a love so deep that it sent you willingly to the cross on our behalf. Show us how to love others as you have loved us. Teach us your compassion, so that we may be your hands and feet to those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. O oh God, by your Holy Spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first reading today is from Genesis 45, verses 1 through 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant on earth 
and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him.
Before we get to our second reading, I'd like to do a little bit of introduction. Uh, in the section just before this reading, Jesus has just been shockingly arguing with the Pharisees. This time it was about why do your disciples not wash their hands? I want you to remember that what the Pharisees were really about was trying to live the most righteous life possible because that way they could claim the promise of God of control over Israel. So they thought if they followed every single rule perfectly that God would get, basically make the Romans go away. So they were very fastidious about everything that happened, uh, everything that was done. This hand washing that they're talking about, this isn't about hygiene, it's about ritual cleanliness. It's about whether you're clean or unclean and able to go into the sanctuary or not. I learned as I was preparing for this message today that there's actually a lot of technical argument going on between Jesus and the Pharisees that I actually had no clue about until I started studying this. Part of it is this discussion about the tradition of the elders. And what this is about is the Pharisees actually had additional books beyond Torah that had rules and regulations to follow to live a righteous life. So when Jesus is talking about the tradition of the elders, he's not talking about following Torah. He's actually talking about some stuff that the Pharisees added to Torah just to be sure that they were righteous enough. The other thing that he, there's this discussion before then about honoring your father and your mother. And what he was actually doing was criticizing them for this kind of sneaky thing they did. There was a requirement that you honor your father and your mother, which was traditionally understood as supporting them when they get old. But what some people were doing was saying, well, I'm sorry, I've already dedicated to the temple those resources, that money, those things. I was going to use to support you, so sorry, Mom and Dad, I can't help you out. And apparently, you didn't have to actually give these things away. You could kind of hold on to them. So when Jesus is criticizing them about honoring the father and mother, that's what that's about. So at the end of this, Jesus criticizes them and says, You hypocrites! Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. So with that, let's turn our hearts and minds to today's Gospel reading, which is from Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 28. Listen for God's word to you today. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached him and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, fault witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David! My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So, at the end of Matthew 15, verses 10 through 20, 
part of the middle or the first part of that section I just read. Jesus and the disciples decide that they need to get out of town. That's probably a good idea since Jesus already knew that the Pharisees wanted to destroy him. That's mentioned in Matthew 12. Now, Tyre and Sidon, they're not in Judea. So that's probably a pretty good place to avoid the Pharisees, well, maybe. But there was a Jewish population there, so he did have a ministry opportunity there. Now, I have to admit, I've had a lot of trouble with this story of the Canaanite woman. I mean, honestly, his words sound pretty racist to me. I mean, did he just call that woman a dog? And as I researched for today's message, I found that I wasn't the only one who had trouble with that passage. And I found a lot of attempts to try to sanitize that message, and I find all of them unsatisfying. So today I'd like to walk through this story with you and share some thoughts about it. To start, let's have a little bit of a discussion about Canaan and the Canaanites. Canaan is first mentioned as the son of Ham, the son of Noah. And he was cursed because his, Canaan's father, Ham, saw Noah's nakedness uh, uncovered. Uh, what that means specifically is a subject to debate. Uh, none of the options I've read are very palatable to, to discuss. But uh, because of what Ham did, his son Canaan was cursed. Canaan's also the name of the promised land where Israel went after Israel left Egypt. Canaan wasn't completely destroyed by Israel, but it does appear that it wasn't a separate nation by the time of the New Testament, but there were indigenous people living there who were descended from the original Canaanites. So, uh, so this Canaanite woman is probably an indigenous person living in a region that's now controlled by something other than her own people. If you go through the Old Testament, you'll find lots of anti-Canaan material. That's probably due to religious differences between the Israelites and the Canaanites. The Canaanites were polytheistic, the Israelites were monotheistic. The Canaanites worshipped idols, Israelites said no graven in images. So the idea was we need to stay away from those Canaanites because they're going to be a bad influence. Intermarriage with the Canaanites was uh, discouraged even before Moses. If you read the story of, of Abraham, he didn't want his son Isaac to marry a Canaanite woman. His son Isaac didn't want his son Jacob to marry a Canaanite woman. And Jacob's twin brother Esau went out of his way to marry a Canaanite woman because he was mad at his father because of the whole birthright thing. He was also pretty mad at Rebecca. So there's also, in the book of Ezra, a very clear directive. There are seven nations that Jews should not marry people from, and Canaan was one of those. So you might think Canaanites are all bad, but that's not true. There are some righteous Canaanites mentioned in the Old Testament, and if you look at Jesus' genealogy at the beginning of the book of Matthew, you'll find a Canaanite woman, Tamar. But in general, the Canaanites were other. They weren't Jewish. They were those other people and we don't really want to have much to do with them, right? So that's one piece of this. The other thing I was curious about was dogs. There's some controversy about whether the Jews considered dogs to be clean or unclean animals, but they do sometimes eat dead things that they find and that would be repulsive to an Israelite, to a Jew. They were not common as beloved household pets, Israel and Judah were kind of late adopters of dogs as household animals. It wasn't unheard of, but a lot of the other neighboring regions, they had dogs uh, as house pets before that. Regardless, dogs were not held in high regard, and calling somebody a dog was certainly not an honor. In fact, dog was actually a slang term for non-Jews. So we talk about those dogs over there. And even now, if you think about it, when we say something's gone to the dogs, we're not saying something really good happened to it. We're saying something bad happened to it. So with these preliminaries in place, let's walk through the story. So Jesus and the disciples, they arrive at Tyre and Sidon, and they encounter the Canaanite woman. Now, this is her home. It's not their home. It's her home. She's still an outsider, though, as far as the disciples were concerned, as far as the Jews were concerned. 
What's interesting is that when she addresses Jesus, she apparently knew who he was, even though she wasn't Jewish. And she acknowledged it publicly. She called him Lord, Son of David. Now, I think every time I've read this, and you're going to find a lot of places where I've misread this in the past, I've heard this as kind of a one-time request, that they were in the area, this one said, Oh, Lord, Son of David, help have mercy on me. But in fact, it sounds like, I was kind of reading my own quiet, introverted ways into this, the more I think about it, the more she was probably following them around as they were going through Tyre and Sidon, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David! Have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David! Have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David! And uh, you can kind of imagine Jesus and his disciples moving through town with this distraught woman yelling behind them. And the disciples, everybody's quiet, right? So they're thinking, maybe if we ignore her, she'll go away. So they're silent. The disciples are silent. Jesus is silent. Seems kind of rude, doesn't it? That, that she's so distraught, and what you're basically going to do is kind of pretend she's not there. Kind of, kind of like sometimes you might be tempted to do if you're in New York City and you see a crazy person in the subway. You don't engage with them. But here's a woman who's pouring her heart out, acknowledging the lordship of Jesus, and they're ignoring her. Finally, the disciples can't take it anymore. And they do what we've seen them do before. You might remember when there was the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples said, you know, Jesus, the people are hungry. Why don't you send them away and have them get some food? They didn't do it themselves. They said, Jesus, we want you to solve this problem with people who haven't, uh, or a problem with these people uh, here. And uh, remember with the uh, 5,000, Jesus said, well, no, you take care of them. In this case, he doesn't do that. And the next part of the story is a little bit ambiguous to me. I'm not quite sure how to read this. Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, if you look at the structure of the story, it sounds like he's speaking to the disciples. But the statement itself sounds like it's more directed at the woman. But regardless of who Jesus was speaking to, the woman heard it and she responded. She knelt, honoring Jesus and his authority, and said, Lord, help me. Now, I wish I could say, the rest of the story goes, she knelt, said, Lord, help me, and Jesus said, you have amazing faith, your wish is granted. But that's not what happens. No, instead what Jesus says is, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And there's a lot that's pretty unpleasant here, especially once you unwrap all the metaphors we just talked about. Dog being slang for Israel. The children here, or the children are actually the children of Israel. Dog is slang for Gentile, I should say. Children, the children of Israel. Now, when I've read this in the past, I've thought about dogs, and I've thought about like packs of wild dogs in the street, and taking food, and just throwing it out in the street. And I've been reading that a little bit wrong, because the word in the New Testament, in the Greek, the original Greek, translates better as little dogs. So some commentators try to soften this whole thing by saying puppies. But I, I don't know if it's a lot better to say it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the puppies. That does, I don't think if I were on the receiving end, I would feel much better about that. So I think we have to live with the idea that he said something pretty harsh. Now there is another reason why that form of the word dog might have been used, and that it's more like a domesticated dog, like a house dog. Uh, not a, a potentially vicious pack animal, but something that would naturally be in the house, under the table, waiting for crumbs and scraps to fall as the people ate their meal. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were on the receiving end of that comment, I would probably not be happy. Right? That's a pretty harsh statement. But what the women did there, she didn't get angry, she didn't seem to feel insulted. She didn't seem to take offense. Maybe she did. If she did, she kept it to herself, taking care of what comes out of her mouth. Instead, she provides an insight. Even the dogs, same form of dogs, even the, the house dogs, eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. This is actually a brilliant response. And I think even the Pharisees, those masters of argument, they probably said, yeah, one for the woman there. She did a good job. Uh, what it suggests is that the table is so abundant 
that she doesn't need a seat at the table. The crumbs that fall off are enough for her. And the faith that she revealed in that single statement was enough. There's no confession of the divinity of Christ. There's nothing like that. It's just, I know that the blessings that come from you, if I just get the crumbs that fall off the table, will be enough. And, of course, what happens is Jesus says, I'm amazed at your faith. Your daughter's healed. And she was. Now, some commentators try to rescue this passage by saying, so what actually happened was Jesus actually was racist. And this Canaanite woman taught him not to be racist, to be less racist. And I have a lot of trouble trying to accept that argument, but I found it in a lot of places. I just can't accept that some person knew some stuff, could teach Jesus something that he didn't as an adult man, son of God as well as fully human, didn't already know. So we have kind of this dilemma. Either we have to accept that there's something Jesus didn't know about living in the kingdom of God, which I have trouble with, or Jesus was a racist, which I have an immense amount of trouble with. I can't deal with either of those suggestions. So I'm going to offer my own opinion. I could be totally wrong. If you think so, feel free to let me know. I think Jesus was exploiting a teachable moment. When I teach sometimes, I'll have to present the class with a situation, and rather than trying to pull an answer out of them, I will just be silent. They don't have to give me the right answer. They don't have to give me a wrong answer. They need an answer so that I can start to work with it. So eventually, the silence gets so difficult that they turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, would you just make her go away? She is so annoying. And Jesus gives a perfectly normal response for a man, a Jewish man who would be living at that time. Steeped in the language that his disciples might have chosen to a woman who's already actually given him honor and acknowledged his power. And I think maybe what's happened here is that Jesus let her speak truth to power. That Jesus, in doing so, let her express her true humanity to show that even though she was not Jewish, she was still a human, that she was uh, worth, worth, that she merited full respect. We see Jesus doing this throughout the Gospels, working with outsiders and affirming God's love for them. Remember, he spends a lot of time hanging out with people that others don't like. Sinners, tax collectors, widows and orphans, all the disenfranchised people, that's where you're probably going to find Jesus. Letting them live their life, not judging them for that, but bringing them into God's love and God's kingdom. So what's happening, I think, in today's gospel lesson is that Christ is breaking down a barrier, in this case, a barrier of nationality. But we know that the love of Christ transcends class and affluence and race and ethnicity and gender and all the factors that we use to identify ourselves and to distinguish ourselves from others. This is part of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that with his help, we can live together as one family in the kingdom of God. We certainly have enough barriers today. Right now, this week, we're celebrating 100 years of women actually being allowed to vote. But we're doing that against the background of protests for racial justice, for stuff that I and my simple-minded thinking thought maybe we'd been done with for a while since we had civil war uh, protests in the 60s. We're seeing increasingly bitter political polarization and even as we deal with the global pandemic, we're getting more and more politicized. I can't think of a time when we've had a greater need to break down barriers or a time when we've had a greater need for reconciliation. So we may all have different callings. We may advocate for different solutions for the problems that face us today. But we must not let these things divide us. And we must not let them just distract us from God's desire that we live together in a loving community with one another and that we demonstrate that love to the world. And so I invite you to join me in the affirmation of faith, the closing of the Belhar Confession. Let us affirm together that we believe that God has received, revealed God's self as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. That God, in a world full of injustice and enmity, 
is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wrong. That God calls the church to follow God in this, for God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry. That God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind. That God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows, and blocks the path of the ungodly. That for God, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering. That God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right. That the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies, among other things, that the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice, so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That the church, as the possession of God, must stand where the Lord stands, namely against injustice and with the wrong. That in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful and privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. Therefore, we reject any ideology which would legitimate forms of injustice and any doctrine which is unwilling to resist such an ideology in the name of the gospel. We believe that, in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, the church is called to confess and to do all these things even though the authorities and human laws might forbid them and punishment and suffering be the consequence. Jesus is Lord. To the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, you have called us to live before you and with one another in all faithfulness. Unable to live as you intend, we inflict harm and hurt on others, and on ourselves as well. In all these ways, we know we grieve your heart also. Hear then our prayers of intercession. Restore us to communion with you and one another, that we might live in the freedom that you have bestowed. We pray for people who are victims of crime, from petty theft to murder. We pray that those harmed will find healing and dwell in safety. Hold especially close to your heart, O oh God, those who have lost a loved one to violence, and help us off to offer tenderness and care in their struggles and grief. We pray also for those who have committed crimes, that they may seek and find forgiveness and begin a new life of responsibility and integrity before you and in the community. We pray for healing and reconciliation where trust has been broken, hostility has flared, or misunderstanding has grown. Restore us not only to one another, but reconcile us to ourselves and to you, loving God. If restoration proves beyond hope, grant new beginnings and possibilities for all. In every relationship, we seek your grace as we honor others by caring for them, being truthful, and working for their welfare. Root out in us any jealousy towards what others possess, and let generosity grow in and among us instead. Gracious God, we pray for those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit, for those who are lonely and isolated from community, for those burdened by guilt or grief, by depression or despair. Do not let us turn inward as a church, lest we shut out or neglect those who long for a community of welcome and companionship. Send us out in love with open eyes, ears, and hearts. Make us true neighbors to one another and true children to, of your own calling. We pray in the name of Christ, who has come to set us free. And now hear us as we pray the prayer you taught us, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, to the one who is able to keep you from falling, and to make you stand without shame in the presence of God's glory with rejoicing, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. Proclaim good news. Be persistent in prayer. Do the work of the gospel and carry out the ministry of Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen.